Welcome to Financial Repression Authority's Roundtable Insight, where the best fund managers, economists, and industry leaders discuss the key investment issues and challenges in the current macroeconomic environment. Welcome to FRA's Roundtable Insight. This is Richard Benulli. Today we have Brian Pellegrini, Harley Bassman, and Ira Harris. Brian is the founder and senior analyst at Intertemporal Economics. He's a noted Austrian theorist and noted as the pragmatic voice on Wall Street. Harley is a University of Chicago trained MBA who migrated to Wall Street at the tender age of 23. After a stint at Drexel Burnham, he joined Merrill Lynch where he stayed for 26 years. While there, he managed both option and mortgage trading, but is more well known for creating the Move Index, the VIX for bonds. Presently, he's managing partner at Simplify Asset Management, an ETF issuer that focuses on products that are long convexity. And Ira's hedge fund manager, global trader in foreign currencies, bonds, commodities, and equities for over 40 years. He served as CME director from 1997 to 2003, and also a stint most recently. Welcome, gentlemen. Hello. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Great. I thought we'd begin just with a broad view of what your thoughts are on the, the current situation in the economy and the financial markets. Uh, maybe we can begin with Brian. Sure. Uh, I think it's a very interesting situation where um, the Fed is battling between the long run uh, deflationary um, impulse, right? Where the rate of return on capital is steadily falling as they've been pushing real interest rates further and further down. Um, but because of, I mean, we were already kind of pushing up against the edge of the curve for the, um, the, the, the global supply chain and COVID just scrambled everything, right? So you had a couple aspects where the rate of potential growth for the world economy, but also for the US economy in particular um, dropped. So they're looking for 4% growth, uh, which might be possible, but at what level of inflation? Um, and so the result is it's co causing the yield curve to pivot. And, um, uh, you know, five-year rates are, are moving up. And no matter how much they talk about tapering or hawkishness or whatever you want to call it, um, the long end of the yield curve keeps moving down. Uh, and that's because uh, people understand, well, the bond market and its, particip its participants understand that the 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 Fed is going to have to have interest rates higher sooner than everybody expected, but then lower longer in the, uh, over the long term because the, the economy simply can't withstand the same real interest rates that it has in the past. Brian, when you say the Fed's going to have to have higher rates, are you talking front end rates or back end rates? Uh, it, at the front end, that they're going to have to either um, accommodate inflation, right? As, as you know, they have this whatever target and a lot of, uh, in terms of growth, but they also have, because you have um, uh, Yellen has so much power in, uh, employment, right? Not, and not just um, maximum sustainable employment, but ideal employment as the Biden administration sees it, right? So they're gonna wanna get a, a, the employment ratio, whether it's possible or not, back up to pre-COVID levels. Uh, and to do that, you're going to have to have um, either very fast inflation or a huge trade deficit. And uh, either way, the, those are both relatively inflationary, and, and the, the latter is politically toxic. Nobody wants to have a huge trade deficit, right? That's the worst thing. Everybody should have a trade surplus, as far as Biden's concerned. Um, <laughs> and uh, the the um, so they're going to have to they're going to have to at least talk about raising interest rates. Whether they even actually get to do it is is questionable, but they certainly will have to talk about it. I mean, I, I would push back there. I think it's back end rates that go up, not front end rates. The front end stays pinned near zero or low, and the, and they let the back end rise to deepen the curve, and which I we'll talk about a bit later. Yeah. Um, if you want to go just you know touching back to the beginning over here, my I guess call it macro thought per se is. Um, you know, for, for, for 10, 12 years now, uh, since the GFC, we've had a, a debt problem. We have too much debt. We are a financial economy and 
that's neither good nor bad. It just is what it is. And if uh, we run a financial, a levered financial economy, you need plumbing to move the money around. And thus the Fed had to go save, the government had to go save the banking system, despite the fact that we had plenty of bad actors back then. Um, but they had to get saved. Did they have to go do QE1? Yeah. Anything after that? Not really. But we have a debt problem, too much debt. And the way you get out of debt is you default or you inflate. And inflation is a slow motion default. I guess you could also argue that uh, a lot of the 40s and 50s, high growth, growth higher than your debt, will, will, will burn that down also. I don't foresee that happening reasonably. Um, but in theory, just to cover all bases as possible. Um, the Fed has basically tried to go and create inflation, uh, which is a slow, silent tax uh, that everyone favors, more or less, except for people who have a fixed income. Um, and um, we, we got inflation. We got a lot of inflation. It's just not in wages and services. We got it in, in assets. Um, so those that say that, that, that the Fed is not printing money, wrong, that they can't create inflation, wrong, they can and they did. We have inflation. In, in, in real estate, in stocks, in bonds, in gold, in art, in silver, in, in, in every jewelry, everything has been inflated, which of course has then created, you know, um, massive income or wealth disparity, um, which is a public policy bad. And there's plenty of history about how most uh, wars and revolutions are preceded by, you know, uh, an exploding Gini index, a, a wealth disparity index. Um, I suppose, you know, I, mean, I guess I've been happy. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to cry about this. I've been, I've, I've owned assets. The boomers have been the asset owners, and thus you can call us the the locus of, of, of America, eating everything in sight. Um, I have four kids, and can you know these kids who uh, make a pretty good living, well above you know the average family of four, can they buy a house right now? That's a challenge, man. Um, and, and, and so uh, the Fed's policies. Um, have benefited some, not others, but I think they have to change. And I think rates going up in the back end is 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 um, not the only way to do it, but the best way to do it. But what would happen to the housing market if all of a sudden they stop supporting it, particularly not just mortgages, but 30-year interest rates? I would say that if I take, you know, a certain amount of, of, of some kind of drug, um, that's fine. Right. If I take too much of it, I become either addicted or dead. Yes, um, and, and, and so dialing back from the overdose money right now back to reasonable money. Um, what's wrong with that? I mean, I think uh, it, the average home price. I think we might have this somewhere on my slide deck. The average home price now, median home price, three sixty five thousand, rough plus or minus. Um, and I'm going to make up numbers. Let's assume someone, nobody buys a house. Well, I'll, I'll buy a house, sorry. But I mean, no one buys a house. They buy a stream of, of, of payments and they will make um, um, something like, uh, uh, let's say they're paying $2,000 a year. That's all they can afford. With rates of two and a half percent, with that money, they can buy the average home of 365. Mm -hmm. If rates went from two and a half to three and a half, mm -hmm. What you would see is the average home price. Why don't you go to slide eight? The average uh, home price would drop from 365 to 320 just by that change alone because people's income do not move that quickly. And so if you look over here, you can see that this acceleration of the red line, which is Case Shiller home price versus the owner's equivalent rent, that red line would come could become pretty close back to the green line with simply a hundred basis point rate increase. Um, right. And what is the moving factor, though? It's not the size of the houses, right? It's the land, right? If you look at the flow of funds index, right, or the system of national accounts, as they call it uh, now, um, uh, the, the, the big moving factor is that in, in um, the mid-2000s, and again now, it's a land bubble, right? So I'm not saying that um, the Fed shouldn't, you know, I, I don't think that they're going to solve any of their problems by printing money. Right, like I'm, I'm not it's saying, try. right? But what I do think is that there won't be this slow unwinding. They've never been able to do that, right? So it'll be, it'll be, uh, you know, um, uh, tighter, 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 and then uh, or getting ready to tighten, and then all of a sudden you have the bubble explodes, and uh, at, because the 
market rate of interest has gone over the natural rate of return for real assets in the economy. So as long as the, the market rate of interest is lower than the average that you can invest in and make money in in the economy, you're going to leverage up and the economy does. Yep. So to have balance in the economy across time, intertemporally, you need to have uh, uh, especially long-term real interest rates um, balanced. And right now at you know negative 1% for the 10-year real rate, um, that says either one of two things. Uh, either we are in an absolutely massive inflated bubble caused by those really low rates and or the uh, rate of return that the economy is able to provide outside of a bubble is extremely low yep. and and possibly negative i mean my my argument is right now that the um uh, the rate of potential growth for the u.s economy is negative right why would we be able to produce as much or more in 2021 with two percentage points fewer workers right and and all the cargo um, containers everywhere all over the place and half of the um the truck drivers who were fired or quit because they didn't want to it's it's more quitting um now they can't get back because their state is legalized marijuana but they are on the drug list because they failed the test so the the u.s economy's potential growth rate has gone negative we we shouldn't be able to produce as much as we did in 2019 or maybe maybe a little bit but not a whole lot more not where we are now and so the industrial production index has not gone anywhere, but the producer price index for manufacturing is going through the roof. So we are running into the, the, the vertical portion of um, the growth curve, right? Where no matter how much you push interest rates down, you can't get growth to go any faster because they're, you've run out of physical capital goods to use, right? That are usable by the size of the labor force, right? We had a capital structure that was very specific that was set up for a labor force of such and such a size and such and such a distribution of skills, right? All of a sudden COVID happens, boom, you know, three percentage of points of the labor force says, I'm out of here. And so far, almost none of them have come back, right? And those people, my, my proposition is, is that they've repriced the value of leisure, right? When everybody says, oh my God, you're gonna die if you breathe in air from, you know, toxic people, right? And people stayed at home, uh, student loan um, interest payments and, and principal payments have been totally suspended. The, the government's in the process of forgetting the loans. They'll never forgive them, but they will forget them. And so a lot of people have had time uh, and, and financial resources handed to them to adjust to being at home. And I think a lot of people said, you know what? If I don't have to pay for my interest, my uh, student loans, and I get health insurance through my spouse, why be at home? Why, why work for effectively the cost of daycare, right? So I think a lot of people aren't gonna come back and all the skills that those people had, um, now people who are purchasing, purchasing those skills, whether they were employers or other vendors, those people need to go find that same set of skills. And so that's why job openings are going through the roof, but unemployment isn't falling. Right. Because now they're having to say, OK, like I used to go to Bill for, for such and such a thing. I know there are other people out there that do this same skill, but I got to find out who they are. I got to interview them and I got to bid them away from others. And so the um, the producer price index for employment services is shooting up really fast. It's above where it has been during past um, periods of full employment. So the late 90s and the mid 2000s. Uh, and again, 2018. Um, so I, I just think we're, we've run out of potential growth and the government and the Federal Reserve don't want to acknowledge that. Or they think that they can get potential growth to rise by sort of if you build it, they will come. And I just, I don't think that's the case. You're a believer that inflation will be, let's call it above 3% come first quarter of next year. This is not a base, a base effect. Yeah, no, it's definitely there's real inflation in the system that that I think this this winter, this the Christmas season is going to be a fiasco. I honestly think someone will be killed at a Walmart fighting over a video game. <laughs> like for real. Like last year or the year before that somebody got trampled. This this year someone will be shot because there will not be enough PlayStations, there will be not be enough headphones and iPads and all I those think things. The internet will take care of all this. Everyone's going to buy it on Amazon. But they're going to want it. 
they're going to say, I need to get that thing for my kid so that they can be happy. And people have a really perverted sense of what's important at Christmas. And if you give them all the credit in the world and all the free money in the world from the government, there's this intense pressure to go buy. But at the same time, you can't get enough cargo containers and you can't get enough microchips, right? So how, it doesn't matter what the demand is, no matter what level of uh, prices they're willing to pay, demand cannot be satisfied, right? Because the yeah. supply curve is vertical. So right? going so up to 30,000 feet, yeah. I, I proposed, and I, I actually, I, the slide is not in my deck, so I apologized, that there's a grand correlation between the labor force growth rate and inflation slash interest rates. Yeah. Um, and thus you saw this huge bulge inflation rates in the 70s and 80s, which was basically the baby boomers working through their highest produ production and, 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 and demand years as they form a household, they have kids, they buy a house, a washing machine, a car, massive demand from this pig in the python boomer generation, demanding goods from the smaller World War II generation, which a few of them got killed. Um, this is supposed to, and we've been on the down cycle for the last 30 years with rates, but it's been projected that you'll see an inflection point, an increase in the labor force growth rate starting sometime two to three, four years from now, which is a, 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 the boomers will stop leaving the workforce because they will have left, mm -hmm. and the millennials will be increasing. So you get this inflection and we get an increase, and this which you get higher rates. That's my proposal for why demographics will increase interest rates in the next few years. It sounds like you're saying that no, it's the other way around. There's going to be a decline in the labor force and thus available supply for these people who want to form buy goods, and that will push inflation up. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't disagree. You 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 probably were would have been right if no COVID had happened, right? So yeah, the, the demographic effects are you know pretty pretty um, stable. The cake. Watch it. Yeah, you can watch it happen over time. So no, you're totally right. We were due for a turn just based on population dynamics, but we had this exogenous event uh, that just suddenly changed people's perceptions. I mean, unless there's no sign of people re-entering the labor force who left at high school level, at college level. Um, the only places where, uh, you know, in the white collar sector that hiring is taking place is in the, um, um, you know, the, the knowledge economy. So the business support functions, administrative functions, those are not coming back at all, right? Well, so- Why the, is that showing up in the, shouldn't, when, when they ask the question of, are you looking for work? Shouldn't you then say no and then drop out of the pool? A lot of those people have, but if you, sort of looking at two sides of it, right? If you look at the employment side, right? The establishment side of the survey, um, uh, uh, the number of people employed in business support functions dropped and never recovered. And I don't think will recover, right? Because there's been a shift in expectations for how much uh, office support you will need. Printing and um, paper manufacturing both fell off the cliff employment and have not recovered at all. But right. you're describing a decline in the participation rate, aren't you? Which, which I, I have no problem with. I'm just trying to nail that yeah. down. So I think there's two. Yes, yes. And so I was saying that for some people, they're they're just like, you know, tire manufacturers or whatever. Um, in the past, uh, buggy whip manufacturers, right? For some people, their jobs are gone and not coming back, right? There will never need to be as many printing manufacturers, right? Yeah. So, so those people are going to have to find a new job and their skill set is much less applicable in the new world than it was in the old. So they might drop out of the labor force as a result of hysteresis, right? Then there's other people who just have repriced leisure, right? So those people have skills. They could and uh, get, go get a job tomorrow. The labor market's red hot, but they have actively decided, I would rather be at home with my kids, with my pets, whatever, watching TV. And the cash flow pressure I faced before is gone, right? Because all those student loans are now whoop, and because of the, everybody's on an income-based repayment plan, right? They set a real trap for themselves. Uh, so right now you pay, if you make um, 240 on-time payments, right? The, the loan is forgiven, right? So the last two years there have been, uh, loans have been suspended, right? But they counted each one towards your forgiveness. So if you've had a 20, if you took out a 20 year loan, uh, you know, the day before COVID, right? 
um, or you graduated college, um, uh, uh, then that means you've had 10% of your loan forgiven already, right? And, and when they, if you were to, when, if they ever do restart payments, they base it on last year's income. So they're going to say, oh, well, your income was zero. So you have to pay $20 a month, yeah. right? So all of a sudden there's a huge tax to going back to work. And there's a whole bunch of goodies coming in from the federal government as well. So they've created a real trap where if they ever want the economy to go fast again and without a, a massive inflation or a massive trade deficit, uh, they're going to have to really give people a kick in the butt to get them out the door and working because they have a huge incentives uh, because of the, um, the student loans. I mean, the student loans were a disaster. I, I've been writing about that for uh, you know, I cut my teeth on Wall Street securitizing student loans. Yep. And so I saw things. It was a problem. It was a bad enough problem back. It's always been tough. Richard, do you want to pull us out of the weeds? Um, yes. Yeah, actually, yeah, just wondering, uh, Ira, if you, your thoughts on some of these issues, if you wanted to. Well, these are, these are for, in my mind, and I know Brian's worked very well for years already. And, uh, and Harley, I followed for many, many years. These are more granular. But I was interested, and Brian started going there because I read Brian's missive on uh, Monday. But Harley pushes a steepening of the curve, and I read and I listened to your. Um, I, first, I had read the paper, and then I listened to that podcast you did with. Uh, uh, um, what's his name? What's his name from? Uh, Hedgeye. What's that? Hedgeye Keith McCullough. Yes. Yeah, from Hedge. And, you know, I'm, I see that totally differently. I see a flattening because I see that the, that the Fed, especially this Fed and this White House, is forced into a yield curve control type of game. So we're going back to the 40s and uh, to 51, of course. Uh, uh, and, I, and I think that's, that's very important. Now, if the markets were allowed to work, I agree with you, Harley, 100%, because the market would do what the market's supposed to do, which is, as always, push the Fed into raising rates to, to stem the curve that they're behind. Right? That's what the market, that's the whole concept of when you were, I, I think we're pretty close in age. Um, I may be a little older. Um, but so, when the so-called, you know, is uh, what's his name, Paul McCauley called them the bond vigilantes, went after the market and did what they were supposed to do, which is, hey, you guys are wrong. You're just wrong here, and we're going to make you pay a little bit on this. So they would push rates higher, and then the Fed would have to respond to raise the short end of the curve, which, and I, and we don't know. You know, I, I saw your six months to eight months. We don't really know, and I've looked at this yield curve for so long, we don't really know how to time it. There, there is a time, it could be anywhere to me, four months to 18 months, all the, depending upon conditions around it, from the way that I look at. But mine is, it's, it's not, it's certainly not foolproof, but it's a pretty big gap there. But I do know that it takes raising rates on the short end to flatten the curve historically. Because the, the market will keep pushing the long end up until the Fed responds or something happens. Yep. There, there's an exogenous event. And this time, I just don't see it because I think they're going to be so desperate. And I think, and I know that we agree on this. We, I, I read your, your work, uh, especially the, what you put out after, uh, I think you were... Um, Part of any large organization, I mean, I, and I could be wrong about that. But, but what we would really see is the market would push. But now the market, it's like in Japan. You know, we always watch Japan, and we saw how many intelligent people got short the JGB mar JGB market back in the late '90s. Uh, I was certainly part of that crowd because I was actively trading, and that made perfect sense because all the underlying fundamentals said, "Well, you know, they're they're growing this debt." Uh, so, and people just, you know, as they say, they famously call it the widow maker. And I'm afraid that we're going to be in this situation now because the Fed, with the White House, can they really allow, 
can they allow? And I mean allow because we're talking about a market that is so controlled by central banks, not just the Fed, by the way, because everybody who followed the Fed down the rabbit hole, the ECB, well, the BOJ, we can argue was there first, but a lot of other banks have gone this route. So we're talking about a huge global phenomenon that we have never seen before, especially because they've been so in sync. So this has, you know, here, I, I, I'm sitting here right now in front of me uh, from 10 minutes ago, a Bloomberg page on, on, on interest rates. And I'm, yeah, hell, the, the Bund is still negative 41, negative 41. So people are forced to shop around looking, looking, looking for value. And especially with these massive sovereign wealth funds. And yep. of course we have the- Let me uh, make two points over here. Number one is, um, I have not predicted higher back end rates at all. Okay. I just said they'd be good if it happened. That oh, okay. policy benefit for it to happen. Okay. But I've been very clear that I do believe in inflation for different reasons than Brian, but that doesn't matter. We'll get the same result. It'll be right. over 3% first quarter, so it will not be a base effect kind of residual from COVID. But that does not necessarily mean that rates are going to rise at all. The Fed could well control them. Which okay. leads to, um, so so I hope it happens, but um, it may not. <laughs> go, 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 go pull up page five, please. I think this is, a, this is a, I mean, listeners here at some point want to, you know, make some money off this deal as opposed to just, we'll just blather mindlessly. Okay. Um, so um, here's my big concern with the world um, and higher rates. We've been in a, in a situation for the last, and you could also, you could go to toggle to number six, also kind of go back and forth there. We've been in a world for the last 20 years where stocks and bonds move in opposite directions locally. So stocks up, bonds down, vice versa. That's your 60-40 portfolio is softened, right? It's diversified, but also it softens the movement. Uh, your risk parity portfolio, so Bridgewater and everything else like that, has been genius. Or else very lucky, right? You have 100 bucks by 130 of bonds, this TYA, the, the tenure contract, $70 of stocks just go by SPX, SPY, just a, a two futures trade, all you gotta do. And that's been a great performance. But what would happen if we had that correlation flip? So stocks and bonds went up and down together. And you can see it happening over here, over time, and back to page five. You can see how it's linked more importantly to inflation slash interest rates. And so the question I have is, if we do get inflation significantly above two and a half, three, if we get rates above four, right? Um, will that correlation flip and go where stocks and bonds move together? And if that happens in a highly levered financial economy, you will have very sad people. And the last two drawdowns we've had, so March of last year, and then 18 before that, right. is we had stocks and bonds run together. That's where the Fed jumped in to go and hallelujah, save us all before we all drown in blood, right? And, right. and, and so that's my concern. And that, thus, that's why I have created products to go and mitigate against that, which we can push later on. But this, I think, is the A number one problem. And, and the question then comes down to, for, 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 for you, I in particular, is if we get rates, inflation, let's say we get inflation of three and a half. So mm -hmm. we're now on the right side of that line but we have rates at one and a half. So a negative two and change real rate. Right. Will that flip the correlation? Is it the inflation that drives it or the rate that drives it? Nominal rate. I'm not sure, by the way. But I do know one thing is that if you look at, if you go down to slide um, uh, 22, what you'll see there is that almost the entire rally in the last X years has been the FANG stocks. Seven, eight stocks, that's it. Everything else is basically unchanged over the last five, six years. And that correlates with a massive drawdown in interest rates. And that's the, I, will, I did not invent this, I'm just stealing it, that the FANG stocks are basically a 70 year duration bond. <laughs> yeah, I, but, but wait, I, and I'm glad we had this because I was gonna go right when I, to the second half of the year of 2018 was that was the cadaver that we can really study because the risk parity people were getting their proverbial asses handed to them. 
so much so that I think Powell really didn't understand how much leverage was involved in those trades. And then when uh, the idiot Mnuchin, sorry, but I'm, uh, I have to, and, it has, and, and that's not a political statement. I don't care you know, whether, whether he was Republican, he is an idiot, but he, call, he starts calling around on Christmas Eve wondering who's in trouble. Well, that was the, the, the sign that all that leverage was coming home and that they underestimated it, just like Greenspan always under, underestimated the concept of home bias. He, he didn't understand the power of hedge funds to invest around the world and throw home bias through its use of leverage to the wind. It, it was an archaic, and, and I think the Fed had no idea, and Powell panicked. Not that there was anybody who was definitely in trouble when they called around. It was kind of interesting that they started on Christmas Eve, but I think that that was exactly right. The risk parity, they were really vulnerable because it was blowing up. And why was it blowing up? Because to use Stan Druckenmiller's phrase, um, Powell invoked the double shotgun approach of raising rates while quantitative quantitative tightening, as, as Peter Booker so beautifully called it. And he didn't understand the impact of it and then got afraid. Now, here we're going to the Jackson Hole. So I think this is a very important, important time. And I think that Powell tomorrow should say, we're starting in September on quantitative, on removing the uh, QE. Good luck in prison on that one, baby. Well, I, I, I understand. Well, if they understood markets, it's better to do it now with the equity markets at all time highs, because then you'll find out what the markets really think rather than trying to tell them. And they, they keep trying to tell the markets what to think rather than for allowing the markets to think and actually show them what they what they need to be doing. I, I, you know, I, I think the Bernanke reaction to the taper tantrum in May of 2013, May and June, was will go down as one of the greatest boondoggles ever because that was a time he could have let that run and find that was it. That was the window. Right. That was definitely the window to get out. Right. It's just like with Greenspan with long term capital management. And um, it wasn't an easy time, but as soon as he stepped in, and which he could do because it was only what, 14 or 15 entities. And I'm sure you were, were you on Wall Street then? Me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, so we knew what was going on. And he could corral them all into a room, even uh, Lehman and Bear Stearns, and tell them what they were going to do. But that ship sailed long, long, long. That was the last time that was going to happen. All it did was set up the game of moral hazard. So I, 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 we're really all in agreement. So I'm glad I had this ability to converse with you because – when I read that, I said, oh, see, and I've read your work for so long, and, re and really, I have, I have great respect for you, because you're such, no, no, Thank I'm not you. smoking you. You're a good thinker. And out of good thinking comes profit-making opportunities. We don't always have to agree, but sometimes in our disagreements, we save ourselves money. Like you may signal something, I go, wow, I didn't think about that. Let me, let me step back before I get deeper involved in this. So... I, I, that's what comes out of this. This is classically, as you were trained at the University of Chicago, that discourse and not validation is the way to profitability. I mean, I can get validation anyway. So what's interesting over here is that we now know, we agree that we are in a um, quasi-stable place put there by the Fed, you know, kind of forcing risk down, the curve down, volatility down, via all these various means. And we're and, and 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 Brian, you're proposing, and Ira, you might agree that we're going to have real, honest to goodness inflation coming up next year and continuing. I'm not talking about hyperinflation in Germany, but you know, a three handle at least, which is a real number, and and and, and well above you know the, their target. Um, and so there is uncertainty, not today, not this year, but a year or two from now, there is massive uncertainty as what happened. And this, so let's go to page 13. And if you look at page 13, what this is, it's the volatility term surface. It is the implied volatility of a one month, two month, 10 month, five year, 10 year option. And notice how you've seen this green line flattened down. So the VIX hasn't really moved from five years ago, 
right? Because the, the red and the green lines on the far left are, are flat, but the long dated vols come down. This is really anomalous. In theory, you think it should be steepening because we know the Fed's here to save us right now, but three years from now, like, are we really that comfortable that things are gonna be okay? Maybe they will, maybe they won't, but that's uncertainty and uncertainty manifests in implied vol. Slide 14, please. Same darn thing for uh, European stocks. Okay, slide 15. Same thing for dollar yen. So basically looking across the globe in various markets, you've seen this compression of the term surface of implied vol. I think this is really the most interesting thing going on over here. I mean, where vol is for one month, who gives a damn man? This is very interesting. And and, and the most interesting from, from page 16 is, is, is this, is that you actually have declining implied volatility for interest rates. Um, and uh, this, this is a longer story of why this happens. Um, and it tends to almost always happen for various supply demand dynamics, but you don't usually see a inverted surface when the index of whatever you're looking at is at the lows. So for instance, when the VIX is 12, you'll see a very steep term surface. When the VIX is at 50, long dated options tend to actually go down. Long dated options tend to reflect reversion toward the mean. So when you get a VIX of 12, you should have a steep surface, right? In this example here, we have a move index of like 62, 65, and you have an inverted term surface. That tells you people think rates are never gonna move ever again, um, or at least they're pricing it that way. And thus, I think the best ticket in the market is long dated options, put options on interest rates as protection against this debacle of the correlation flipping. Um, and, and so that's what my focus has been for the last year is this kind of trade and ways for civilians to go and uh, gain access to it. It doesn't mean I think rates are gonna go higher, but in the same way that I buy fire insurance on my house, not expecting it has to burn down, but if it did burn down, I'd be very sad. Um, that's why you buy insurance on rates right now because we do get higher rates. I'm not predicting it, but if we do get higher rates, it will be a catastrophe for financial markets. And at this stage of the game, the insurance on that risk is at record lows. Harley, can I, I'd like to ask you a question because you've been writing about this for quite a few years already. And I read it and I, and especially in 2018, when we saw that movement in the second half of the year and the risk period, but when Bill Gross, who I know, you know, you know well, uh, when he was advising selling Val, right? I mean, he said that was the way that he was trying to pick up when he had moved from PIMCO to um, um, Janice. Janice. Yeah. Right. And he was, and he put out, and I, and I was kind of shocked by that, but it allowed me, and I'm asking you a question. I'm not, I don't know the answer. Have these risk parity players wound up selling Val as a way to, try to generate a little extra and that they've made this happen by searching for that with, and that that's one of those unknown vulnerabilities that exist. And I think you happen to be right because you're seeing this, but it tells me something's wrong here. Um, you're kind of half right, half wrong. Okay. When right. a Bill Gross or someone of that ilk says they're selling vol, they're selling one to three month options. Okay. That's why you have on this yellow chart, the little tip on down. If I, if I, this is an older chart, if I update it, you'd see it would actually have a bigger arch to it. So they're selling this short day, they're selling VIX options, right? One, three month options. Um, and that's, that's gamma. It is ball, but it's gamma, it's convexity, it's short dated movements. Okay. Um, the right side, the long stuff, no one sells that. Yeah, well, people do sell it, but it's in structured note form, so they don't actually see it, and which is why you see the pressure down on that. And the hump is caused from the buyers of the two to three year sector, and that buyer is the mortgage market, because a Fannie or Freddie mortgage-backed security 
which is basically a callable bond, right? The homeowner is a 30 year mortgage. He can prepay it, call it any month for 30 years. It tends to be called in year seven and thus the average volatility, the, the theoretical modeled embedded option is a two to three year option on the 10 year rate. And that's why you get that hump there. You're selling of like the Bill Grosses of the world or the Two Sigmas or everyone else out there in the front, three month. You have the buyer, the two year, three year option from the mortgage servicers, the mortgage hedgers. You have the selling of the five and 10 year option from structured notes. Okay. I, really, I, I, I really, that I, because this is such a weak point in, I mean, I've been trading for 44 years and probably with my education, because I was lucky to, to really be educated in this uh, when I was in school, Bretton Woods had just fallen apart and I wound up studying multinational corporations and the flow of funds. So I, but a guy who you may well know gave me a three hour tutorial on the convexity, Fred Arditi, you remember Fred Arditi? He wrote the, the name, derivatives. I mean, he was at the CME. So one day I, have my, I was curling my, my hair thinking, he goes, sit down. And he took, he said, here's my office. And he went to his whiteboard and for three hours gave me, he says, you can understand this. I said, I'm not sure I can. He says, I know you can understand it. So, uh, but I appreciate it. And it's one of the things I love reading about because it it's such a weak point in all my work. And you, you approach it from a global macro way and you get there, which I have great respect for because again, a gigantic hole in my whole trading existence. Well, people, I plug for myself, if you care to go read what I was talking about, you can find it at uh, convexitymaven.com. Uh -huh. That's our okay. website, and that's where I have my entire library of what I've written. I wouldn't advise reading all of it, but there's a few, uh, a few, a few choice ones I like. Uh, as my wife says I'm a, I'm an idiot savant, so it, you know, for me to sit down and do that, that's not. A, it just, I just have to have a big enough bottle of whiskey. <laughs> And uh, Brian, what are your thoughts also on the investment implications of what, what we have talked and see here? Uh, I mean, I think there's um, another aspect, which is the underfunded pension funds. Um, and they are distorting the derivative market a lot. But uh, I, I don't disagree with, um, with Harley. There's definitely a, a great thesis. Brian, by the way, that's exactly why the Fed should want higher rates in the yeah. back end. I mean, go, 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 go look at AIG stock versus the 30 year rate over the last 18 months. It, it moves in lockstep. It's almost as if AIG is a, is a US Treasury futures contract, it's rather amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so to the degree that the pensions and insurance companies are strengthened, which is a public policy good by a steeper curve and higher back end rates, that's a good thing. You know, there's so many good things for raising rates a little bit. I'm talking like, you know, a couple hundred basis points. I'm not talking 500. And, and, and I don't think you're going to break the economy. I, I, I don't think building a factory is dependent upon rates being, whether it's their 2% or 4%. If, if, I mean, at 10%, yeah, but if, if you're building a factory and, 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 or some capital investment, long-term investment, and a small rate move of a few hundred basis points destroys the project, it's not happening anyways. So... It's a, I think that's that's a really good point. Uh, well, classic is as, as Brian, as you learned under uh, the great man Bernard, the cost of capital has to mean something. I mean that's capitalism. So Harley's point is a uh, hundred percent right. And I think some of this we might see because again, we, we now have bigger actors than we've ever had. I, I find it interesting that uh, you cite AIG because uh, I had bought that stock back when it was on its lows and held it for years and years. I finally gave up and it was a good play, but at $48, $49, because the stock just couldn't go anywhere. And, and I agree with you 100% as, as to why, but now we have gigantic actors like the uh, Government Pension Investment Fund out of Japan. Everybody's searching for those types of yields. Um, and you have sovereign wealth funds. I mean, you have actors that dwarf anything we could imagine. I mean, we used to think that PIMCO was a big bond player. In the, wor in the world of global capitalism today, they're not that big. Look at, we have BlackRock with uh, 9 trillion, but that's a different type of 9 trillion than the 
than the Saudi Sovereign Wealth Fund, the Russian Sovereign Wealth Fund, the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund. These are different types of actors with different types of needs. And, they, and then, of course, throw in the Swiss National Bank, which has now jumped into that arena you know, through the uh, miracle of alchemy. Um, and the world is still willing to take Swiss francs, you know, no matter, and, and they can buy real assets. So, but there are huge, huge players all in search of what Harley and Brian, you so beautifully talk about. So, and how do they affect this? I, I think we're, I'm still learning every day because I've seen them in their ability to move markets. And I go, what just happened? And you, you know, it can only emanate. And then you have the Chinese who are using, there's no question in my mind that they use the futures market with unbelievable leverage to move all types of uh, pricing around because it's in their interest. Now, if I'm, if I'm the People's Bank of China sitting on $3 trillion in, in dollar assets, okay, so let's make it $2 trillion because they've got a trillion somewhere else. It behooves me to try to generate better returns than I know the, the Fed is trying to, or the U.S. Treasury was to give me because they're operating against my interests, which is, hey, I'm driving down... Um, uh, interest rates to meet my needs, but they're not satisfying the, the People's Bank of China's needs. They are, they have totally, so it doesn't surprise me. I, I had a fairly intense discussion at the, with the Richard as the moderator with David Rosenberg saying, there's no question that the Chinese are stockpiling raw materials. And why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you in the height of the pandemic when prices were dropping and the, and the Fed was coming in and orchestrating an, an absolute um, a dollar sell, uh, well, to push the dollar down and everything else with it to whatever benefit. If I'm the Chinese, instead of acquiring Maseratis, uh, Dali, um, Picassos and everything else, I'm going to buy things that I need and stockpile. And, and we're seeing it and it actually bearing fruit because now when they want to keep a lid on prices, what do they do? They go to the stockpiles that supposedly didn't exist, and they and they auction them off to their to their firms and and uh, manufacturers who need those goods. They've been doing that with copper, iron ore. So they've actually played this beautifully, and it, and it has an impact. I I don't understand the impact, but I see the impact, and I'm trying to gain a greater understanding. I'm very interested in when they. Uh, run out of their stockpile of semiconductors. <laughs> that's going to be like what I think they're, the interesting thing about the stockpiling um, for uh, a financial trade war, you know, like, um, you know, uh, uh, tariffs and whatnot. Um, but there's also this element of when you have shortages, uh, uh, sort of a uh, tr trade war of, I'm not going to let you have such and such. Uh, and so the, 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 supply chain for semiconductors is is very very fragile so now uh, you're predicting they invade taiwan because that's the biggest <laughs> maker of semiconductors not under normal circumstances but think about it if you have um a, 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 a severe shortage such that i mean what we have the the production of heavy tractor trailers is falling right because they don't have the chips so at a certain point, you go below the, the production rate of trucks goes below the replacement rate and our bench, our, our, our bottleneck starts to shrink. So there's, there is definitely a point where uh, it becomes strategically valuable or um, it makes sense to, to say no more chips for China. Right. And then at what point do they, what point do they decide? Well, uh, you know, we did the same thing to Japan in, in, in 1940 and it started a war. So we, we, cut off their supply of oil. Um, they said, hey, well, we got 18 months worth of oil. I guess we got to start a war and win it in 18 months. So <laughs> I don't think that's the base case, but if I was if I was looking at risk out, you know, five years, it, it starts to become more realistic, especially if they think that um, the United States is weak or bogged down. I mean, the, the you know, uh, Biden has taken a lot of heat over letting Iran kind of feel more safe, but we don't, we don't need oil anymore. 
right? We can, we can get plenty of oil here in the United States. The best thing that could happen for the United States would be a Mad Max where the Saudi Arabia and Iran blow each other up because we can produce 20 million barrels of oil. That's no problem. It would be bad but it, it, for the world, but for the United States, it would be very similar to after World War II where we had all the manufacturing capacity. So it's the, the broken windows fallacy works great if you can send somebody to go break windows in the town next door to you, right? <laughs> it, so it, it's, it's, it works that way. And it works very frequently for the United States because we're very far away from everybody else and, and the global chessboard, which is, which is Eurasia. So, um, uh, uh, you know, so, so but, but if we cannot hold um, the, the inner island chain uh, uh, in the South China Sea and then uh, up around to, to Japan, um, China's going to take advantage of that. And, it, it, you know, I, I'm not saying this is a base case, but you have to be realistic about risk. And the fact of the matter is um, when two, when a rising power wants to supplant a, an entrenched power, um, it, it can get a little dicey. And, and you start looking for what are the, what are the potential triggers for a conflict? and saying you can't have any more semiconductors is a good way to start a war. So I, I, I would watch out for that. I also think Intel is a great buy because they're about to have money shoved down their throat to build capacity in the United States. So if anybody's gonna get free loans uh, from the government for national security reasons, it'll be trucking companies and uh, 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 chip manufacturers, Intel specifically. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, great. Yeah, it's been an insightful discussion. We're coming up to a time constraint here. Just uh, your final thoughts and how can our listeners learn more about your work? Uh, Harley? Um, you know, uh, as noted, uh, convexdmaven.com. If you want to go and be on my email list, harley at passman.net. Uh, I'm sitting with Convex, with a Simplify Asset Management, which is a very clever firm making ETFs that I really can't mention, although I, we do have an ETF that offers a um, interest rate hedge. So you should go look that up. I designed it. It's pretty clever. Um, and, and, you know, um, we all know what's going to happen. Okay. You can't print money faster than the growth of the underlying economy. We know you can't do that. In you know, five, 10,000 years of recorded human history, uh, I have not seen that happen yet. Um, but it can take a long time for it to occur much longer than our investment lifetimes. And so this idea that the Fed or the fiscal policy or MMT is going to blow up the world or the, at least the financial world next month, I think it's kind of bogus. Could it be Could it be 20 years? Yeah, it sure could be. Um, it could take quite a while to go and do this. Um, but the idea is to go and be prepared for this possible eventuality, knowing that um, uh, pigs can fly if shot out of a big enough cannon, but eventually they come to earth as bacon. <laughs> Great. And your thoughts, uh, Brian, your f final thoughts and how can our listeners learn more about your work? Sure. Um, I think it's very important to consider um, the Austrian side of things where you're thinking about the capital structure and not just in terms of financial math. Um, and uh, people who are interested in my work, uh, um, I generally I, I publish uh, to subscribers, but you can check me out on LinkedIn. I have a weekly for free that I put out. And um, if they want are interested in the free trial, they can uh, email info at acrosstime.net. Great. And Ira? I'm just uh, here doing what I do. I, I'm reading everybody else's no, but uh, trading and uh, I still write notes from underground, which um, is a real tribute to the Austrian school because I the Austrian school has taught me that things are never as as you think that they are. You have to dig deeper. I think, you know, when you go through the great Austrian minds, not that I'm of one school, I'm not. I think Keynes brought some great things to the table too. I think he's been bastardized terribly, but there's nuggets to be found everywhere, which is why, you know, uh, I read Harley, I read Brian. There, I have my things that I have, um, filtered down. And uh, so I write and I'm still thinking this is like really a great opportunity, opportunity um, to be able to cover a lot of ground. And some of the things gnawing at me, Harley was able to answer. And I, I really appreciate it because I took, and I do, I, I read them and I, 
I have four kids too, Harley. So I don't know if mine are older than yours, but uh, I know what it's like to raise them through that. And to, to uh, uh, so I really I appreciate so many things that you you talk about. Uh, so, and one thing that, and I know we're not going to get into it, but set for the next time is the this role of the standing repo facility, and does it affect your thinking? I'm just throwing it out there for next time, so it's food for thought because I'm one who thinks that that makes a difference. That, and the fact that it was pushed on the Fed by the G30, and no, that's not a government institution. It's an institution of uh, individuals who we all are aware of who have a great influence in the world of finance, but they push that on the Fed. So it's interesting to see how that's going to, uh, w whether or not it'll give uh, Powell a little more intestinal fortitude. Awesome. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you. That was great. Thanks, Rich. All right. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye-bye. The FRA Roundtable Insight Show is for informational and educational purposes only and should not be considered as a solicitation or offer to purchase or sell any securities. The investments, investment strategies, and investment philosophies discussed or presented on the show each involve their own unique risk factors which are not discussed on the show. Any discussions among the panel participants or responses to listener inquiries are based on the personal opinions of the panel participants and do not take into consideration the listener's suitability, objectives, or risk tolerance. Please be advised that you invest or speculate at your own risk.